Thank you all for joining us again this afternoon for this special um, webinar on social protection in South Africa, building back better. Um, before we start, I just wanted to give you a, an overview of what the Center of Excellence is, and then I will hand over to the moderator this afternoon, Dr. Stephen Dever. So the Center of Excellence in Food Security is an initiative of the Department of Science and Technology National Research Foundation, and it is hosted by the University of the Western Cape and the University of Pretoria. The aim of the center is to undertake innovative research and critical inquiry to enable South Africa to tackle the challenges of food security and nutrition in South Africa and beyond. Of course, we know that food insecurity is caused by a number of factors ranging from a lack of income with which to purchase sufficient and nutritious food to the ability of the country or region to provide affordable food to its population, as well as the constraints on the physical environment limiting the production of food such as water scarcity, poor soil quality and climate change. Um, this webinar series is part of our ongoing commitment to collaborative um, knowledge creation and dissemination as we navigate through these uncertain times. We hope that the rich discussions that will follow um, will strengthen collaborations and bring about a change needed for sustainable and equitable livelihoods. I now want to hand you over to Dr. Stephen Devereux, who is the South African Research Chair, UK, uh, UK Bilateral Research Chair in Social Protection for Food Security, who will moderate this session for us. Before I do so, I remind all of you, please, if you are not a presenter or the moderator, please keep your video off and your microphones on mute. If you are on the socials, please tweet, please post um, and share uh, what you are hearing here um, via those posts. In the chat room, please drop us your questions and we will filter these and, uh, and, and send these out to the moderator. Thank you all for joining us. Stephen, over to you. Thank you very much, Lorca, and welcome to everybody. When the COVID-19 lockdown was announced and the president announced the 500 billion rand package of support to those affected by COVID-19 and the lockdown, it seemed like social protection would be a big winner from COVID-19 in the sense that it was suddenly recognized the importance of providing support to people that need urgent support for whatever reason, livelihood crisis, or in this case, an epidemic, a pandemic. Um, since then, of course, that was now five months ago and uh, things have moved on. We've learned a lot about how effective the government response was and some of the shortcomings. But there's also now a critical turning point. In October, the package of support, the new interventions and the expanded uh, grants will come to an end. And at the moment, there's no clear way forward beyond that. So there's an immediate issue about what happens after October to all those people that will still be unemployed or having lost a lot of income. Um, and the longer term issue, what is going to happen to social protection in South Africa in the longer term? So to debate these issues, we have three very distinguished people that have worked on these issues for a long time in different ways. I'm going to introduce them and then we'll get started with the discussion. I'll start with Lynette Mart. Lynette is National Director of the Black Sash, which is a 65 year old veteran human rights organization advocating for social justice in South Africa. Black Sash's mission is to work towards the realization of socioeconomic rights as outlined in the South African constitution with an emphasis on social security and social protection for the most vulnerable to reduce poverty and inequality. Lynette has extensive experience of working in various capacities in the not-for-profit sector, the heritage sector, and early childhood development in disadvantaged communities. She also served as deputy director of the Robben Island Museum, project manager at the St. George Cathedral Crypt Memory Center, and senior development, uh, senior organizational development consultant at the Community Development Resources Association. Isabel Fry is the founding director of Studies in Poverty and Inequality Institute in Johannesburg. Previously, she was a director in, at a commercial law practice. She worked for the Black Sash as advocacy manager and then moved to the lady as a senior researcher in poverty and socioeconomic rights. SPI, or SBII, undertakes research into poverty and social exclusions and poverty analysis in the field of anti-poverty policies, inequalities, socioeconomic and constitutional rights and social protection. Isabel serves on the Academy of Science of South Africa, Standing Committee on Science for the Reduction of Poverty and Inequality. She's an active contributor to print and broadcast media on policy issues on poverty, inequality and socioeconomic rights. And she was appointed as one of the first national minimum wage commissioners by the Minister of Labor in 2019. 
And our third panelist is Professor Alex van den Heerfer, who presently holds the Chair of Social Security Systems Administration and Management Studies at the University of the Witwatersrand. <laughs> he has worked in health economics, public finance, and social security in various capacities, including participating in the Taylor Committee of Inquiry into Comprehensive Social Security in the early 2000s, and the Ministerial Task Team on Social Health Insurance. He has also held positions in the Department of Finance, the Industrial Development Corporation, the Center of Health Policy at the University of the Witwatersrand, and the Gauteng Department of Health. He's also worked in an advisory capacity to the Department of Social Development, the National Treasury, and the Interdepartmental Task Team on Social Security. So those are our three panelists, and we look forward to a very uh, stimulating discussion around the question of what happens to social protection post-COVID-19. And I guess we're not just talking about whenever COVID-19 leaves South Africa, which at the moment looks like a long time away, but in the immediate future, what happens post-October when the current relief package comes to an end? So let's kick off the discussion by asking a kind of framing question or a background question. What, in your opinions, are South Africans entitled to expect in terms of social protection? What are the, what are the entitlements and the rights to social protection that South Africans have? Um, and then we'll look at how effectively they've been protected or not during the COVID-19 crisis. Who would like to kick off? Okay, let me go. Then, right. thank you. So um, the National Development Plan um, for 2030 has a, has a couple of issues um, that are raised in terms of expectations. Um, there is the idea of a comprehensive food security and nutrition strategy that the state will launch. Um, there is um, the social wage, and the social wage include um, non-fee paying schools, uh, free basic services, um, subsidized public transport, um, a broadening of the public employment uh, program um, so that households don't live uh, below a determined income. Um, there's also better social welfare services. There's the issue of a social protection floor um, that can progressively be realized through raising employment, um, or rising employment, um, higher earnings, social grants, and other aspects of social wage. Um, the state also talks in its national development plan under the social protection provisions that it will provide income support to the unemployed through various um, active labor market initiatives, such as public works, skills development, and et cetera, et cetera, and that it will pilot a whole range of, of schemes um, in order to, to help people um, with that. I want to uh, bring into that the United Nations um, Committee on um, International um, Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in their recommendations um, to the South African government uh, made the following um, points, which I just want to introduce. The one is that government raised the level of government social assistance benefits to a level that ensure an adequate standard of living for recipients and for their families ensure that those between the ages of 18 to 59 with little or no income have access to social assistance and the government is obligated to pro uh, provide a report on its progress by October 2020, the same um, day that, uh, or the end of October 2020, the same day when the COVID grant and the caregivers grant will end. It also says that um, government needs to expand the coverage of um, unemployment insurance benefits to all workers, regardless of their status. Um, consider the introduction of a, in, of a universal basic income grant and address all the, the challenges of delivery that was related to the outsourcing um, of social grant payments. That's my input for now. So I'm just going to jump in before Alex does, because he's also going to have quite a definitive um, list, I think. Um, Lynette set out in, in detail a lot of the programs that are available and the obligations. I think my understanding of what South African people living in South Africa are entitled to is really located in the Constitution. So Section 27 makes provision for um, access to adequate food and water, social security, healthcare, 
Section 26 makes provision to, to housing. So essentially what our constitution makes available uh, is a guarantee of access to all. So it's not just limited to, uh, to citizens in South Africa. Of uh, the modalities of achieving the fundamental right of dignity, which is contained in the constitution. So the, the social wage, social protection makeup, um, to my understanding, is guaranteed through um, ways of progressive realization. So though not everybody is entitled to access um, to all the rights immediately, on the state is a, a heavy obligation to progressively uh, realize access. I think the the other thing that I wanted to say is that some of the terms, Stephen, can be quite confusing when we use them interchangeably. So the social protection uh, referring to a broader basket of, of interventions than just income or social security. Um, as I understand, the way that uh, I use it is to include um, um, access to the food, the water, housing, as I was saying, education, healthcare, um, as well as aspects such as transport, um, and employment guarantees. So it's a broad basket. What I work most closely on um, is social security. And we'll get on to discussions about the, the social security grants uh, that are made available through um, the state and, and the negotiations at NEDLAC right now in terms of expanding them. But um, I think that the actual, the, the programmatic um, ways in which people are entitled to, to receive aspects of the social protection should be located in the constitution. And I think our ability to debate the adequacy of those uh, legislative and other policy measures, such as at this webinar, are crucial. So thank you. Yeah, so maybe if, if I kind of begin from a, asking a sort of very fundamental question, why do we need social security? Um, why does society not just automatically generate it? Why does the market not? And so the um, pretty universal understanding that has evolved to date is that um, uh, most economies and societies do not automatically generate um, uh, stable, balanced communities and societies. They have structural weaknesses that um, effectively mean that some people will be excluded on uh, uh, from from society and from from sort of viable and reasonable life parts. So the uh, so the question really is what adjustments do we need to make to our overall um, structure in society to ensure that we have a well balanced community and society and and that's really where the the, the rights would derive from is that there must be a rationale for the intervention and the intervention essentially has its purpose um, in uh, in the correction of what will fail structurally if we do not intervene. And so we will have structural winners and structural losers, and we will have people who will be long-term excluded from society if we do not have countermeasures in place. So the whole policy configuration around social security is about making that adjustment and um, understanding uh, where it must, uh, where the interventions are specifically required. And it also requires, therefore, that one distinguishes between what are sort of fairly remedial forms of intervention, quite minimalist, ones that don't really make much of a difference to the structural disadvantage that arises um, uh, pretty much automatically in the way society is configured in the absence of these interventions. Uh, so you, uh, so you, uh, uh, so the, the, the kind of minimalist interventions don't really make a difference. They kind of preserve life without making a difference to the overall game. So that's really what I, I think needs to be looked at. And, and therefore, it, it, what is looking at achieving certain effects out of the overall sets of interventions through social security, not just assisting um, uh, uh, the, the sort of creating a sort of a raft of um, of, of, of interventions. Of, uh, so the, uh, and, I, and I think that toward that objective, we haven't really in South Africa had a proper debate around the definition, the section 27 definition of social security and what it's meant to be. We don't have a formal definition of social security in law. Um, what is social assistance in relation to social security? 
And, um, and there are a lot of things that derive from the wording, but we've had no clarity of definition, no policy framework that developed, that's been developed around that, that, especially, that essentially also defines very explicitly what our complete right would look like and how we would progress toward achieving it. And in that vacuum, we're left with these um, myriad of little policies that actually at the end of the day don't achieve much because they're never at sufficient scale to transform society or to correct it. So that's, so I haven't got into the detail, but that's sort of a broader perspective. Right, thank you all three of you. Um, so maybe a first idea that we could take forward is that we need to have conceptual and legal clarity on what we mean by social security and social protection in, in South Africa. Um, as you pointed out, um, Alex, we don't have a social protection or social security policy or strategy. We've got the white paper from way back. We have a chapter in the National Development Plan. But uh, yeah, we need maybe more clarity and, and, and legal underpinnings for the social security system that we already have. Um, but I think you all made the point that we have a rights-based approach in South Africa, which is quite uh, distinctive, not unique in the world, but quite unusual. And that gives people claims as citizens and residents in South Africa. You have a claim to social assistance from the state and social insurance as you need it. However, although this is uh, very much applauded globally as a, as, a, as a comprehensive system compared to many other countries, it's not, of course, completely uh, comprehensive. We do have gaps. So maybe we could just reflect now on, on what gaps in the social protection system or at least the social safety net, narrowly defined, have been exposed by COVID-19. Um, so what did we have in place before and what gaps are remaining, which clearly need to be urgently filled um, and which the COVID-19 response has attempted to some extent to, to, in, to intervene to fill those gaps. What are, what are the gaps in our social protection or social security system? So Stephen, if I could just come in here really to bridge the previous points and the question that, um, that you've raised. Um, I think one of the problems with the lack of definition or legal categorization of social security also lies in the aspirations of what social security seeks to do. So what I want to raise is a, a huge um, lack of understanding of what universal enjoyment of social security would be. And um, the, the rest of the panel can come to that in discussion, discussing social relief of distress. So just to say that somebody is on a register receiving some cash does not entitle, it's, it's, it's not um, to my mind, the state meeting its obligations for universal enjoyment of social security. So um, my response to that question would be first and foremost is that there is no um, indexing of what social security should enable someone to, to receive. So one of the things that SPY um, has worked on, and this was with Alex and a number of other research organizations, has been the development of a concept of a decent standard of living, a decent standard of life. So that translates into an income amount, so I won't go into that, but just to say that in order to, um, in, in order to be able to evaluate the adequacy of a system, we also need to have first and foremost in our mind, the kind of freedom that that would enable someone to have. And so to my mind, that's the link of the right to dignity, which should be a fundamental freedom of people in South Africa. Um, so it's not just headcount, but it's also adequacy of the um, support response. Um, can I let come just, in next? Yeah, Lynette, just let me, let me just underline what Isabella has just said. Okay. So when we talk about a comprehensive system, we, may, we mean both coverage, who has access to social security and, and grants and so on, but also the adequacy of those grants and, and benefits. Is it enough to help people to survive with dignity? So it's the coverage, but it's also the adequacy or the indexing, as you were calling it. Great. Okay. Um, Lynette. Okay. Um, I think I'm just going to do a, a kind of a simplistic um, way of getting into this question. Um, for the Black Sash, uh, we look at two categories. There might be many, many more. But the first one is around social assistance. There's also the social insurance um, component, and I will speak to that just, just now. Um, and, and so if one, if one look at those, just so those two components, um, co the COVID-19 pandemic has led um, to a global economic and humanitarian crisis. And we know that South Africa has a dire economic um, situation. 
um, the challenges that we had with poverty, unemployment and inequality um, has become even bleaker. And I mean, at, in 2019, the last quarter, the South African stats uh, picked the unemployment rate at um, 10.4 million um, people. Now, we also know that the South African economy in its current configuration will not absorb um, all the unemployed. Uh, the South African Reserve Bank predicted a negative growth of um, minus 6% for this year. And we don't know what that would be in the future. In the previous 20 years, we haven't generated um, many, many new jobs. In fact, we had a lot of job losses. So the unemployment um, challenge is a big one, and it's also been compounded by, by automation. And we do need to look at this. Um, so the, the second one is, is that the, the, the um, social protection mechanisms have also exposed and compounded the food insecurity. And so while the constitution make provision for social security, um, and we have the categories of the aged, of um, children, and which is highly inadequate, and, and the disabled, um, there's also a category or a group of people aged between the ages of 18 to 59 years with no or little income who has no social assistance. So there's a huge gap there in terms of our provisions. Um, and the other um, issue is that um, the, in the informal economy, um, there are many who are also employed precariously and many of them are not benefiting. While the state tried to adjust the UIF provision, which is like a social insurance measure, there are many um, that are outside of that system, um, partly because they are un, uh, informally employed, um, partly because they are precariously employed, and then there are people who don't pay over those amounts of money. There were some adjustments to the UIF, but the UIF system as a whole um, also needs to, to, to be reviewed. Maybe I'll pause there for now. Yeah, so it, if I look at, sort of break it up into two issues. Um, the one is what COVID revealed, and then there is what we already know about what needs to be done. And um, so the, uh, but which leads to a discussion of what our rights are in terms of the constitution, <clears throat> which have not been clarified. And I want to deal with that very specifically. On, on what the COVID crisis revealed, which we also predicted a lot of us predicted right up front was that we, so right at the start, we actually have no systems in place to be able to target vulnerable people because all of our systems depend on people having to register when they are in need. So you can pretty much say two to three months of registration processes and corruption associated with people getting onto systems and then some, some trickling of benefit will, will go to people. And this was the experience in TERS through uh, the, um, uh, it, it, uh, as well as um, other benefits and the absence basically of an administrative system in which people are pre-registered is a it hugely compromises our ability to respond in a crisis but social security systems aren't just designed to respond to a crisis they're designed for an ongoing rebalancing of society and ensuring a that that dignity is achieved across all of society um, and so it's, it's a kind of a long-term proposition. But a very well-developed social security system can deal with crises. It can target vulnerable people. It can, um, and it can also provide more general support if you need to kind of helicopter drop benefits onto society. So um, we had no capacity for that. So SARS, uh, the revenue services, also don't have the registries that would allow them to actually provide any benefits. They haven't developed the systems for them. UIF does not have those systems. And um, they're essentially a system as well, which doesn't re register contributors. So you do not have your entitlement built up as an account with the UIF, making it incredibly difficult to immediately translate uh, for instance, a furlough type benefit from your original entitlement. It just has information on the employers. So these are huge flaws and they mean that we really can't respond in a crisis. And those are also the systems upon which we rely for our long-term benefits. 
Um, a further problem with the UIF is, uh, and our, our frameworks is we have no integrated system of income support coupled with other forms of support such as labour activation and interventions in, in labour markets to improve access or to transition people from one employer to another. We have a very um, uh, we, don't, we have a very inflexible system of unemployment insurance support and we have an incredibly lazy Department of Labour who doesn't really evolve with a, a system to, uh, uh, to benefit society long term, they just perpetuate what they have. So these are parts of the machinery which we do have to change. And I, and I want to sort of, uh, and uh, the, the same problems emerged with the social grant system. SASA is also not organized to do anything other than allocate benefits when, upon registration. And the food parcel distribution was an absolute catastrophe and uh, predictably up front, uh, as well as prohibitions on food, food parcel distribution by, by NGOs and other people which have no logical reason whatsoever. So those are all revealing problems with our system and the speed with our response and the accountability of the systems, which are all weak. They all need to change. In the case of the talking about what um, uh, sort of developing on Isabel's comment, uh, the issue about the social, the um, uh, um, Section 27 is that we essentially have an obligation or government has an obligation to progressively realize the right to social security on the assumption that you cannot re re realize it overnight. Now the question is what you have to have in place to realize, to achieve progressive realization in a manner that is, is constitutional. You essentially have to have a very clear understanding of what the complete, look, complete right looks like today. Even if you can't implement it, you need to know what it looks like today because you're going to progress it and then you're going to have to have a, a plan which takes you progressively toward that objective, however it is defined. And in the definition of that right to social security, you have to engage with society on what our right would look like, even if it can't be provided today. Have we engaged with society on what that complete right looks like? We haven't. So we don't even have a definition. We don't have an idea of what our complete look right looks like. Therefore, as it stands, it's not justiciable. We can only take government to court for not having at least started the process of defining the right. And so at, at this point in time, we can't take government to court for not having provided something that is contained within the constitution. So these, I think, are the, are the challenges that we face and it creates it, an enormous laziness in government that has allowed it not to do anything using progressive realization as an escape clause to do nothing. And I think that that was not the purpose of the constitution and it has been clarified that all the positive rights in the Bill of Rights are justiciable. And essentially there has to be an active process of now developing what the Bill of Rights means in relation to social security. And the fundamental starting point is what does the complete right look like? And then we can talk about how we get there. Thank you, Alex. Uh, you've highlighted a number of systemic and political failures in the in the social protection and social security system. Um, and I guess that also goes back to the point of what's the rights that people have to social security. What is a social contract, if you like? And if you don't have a fully specified right, then we don't have a fully developed social contract. What we have is rights to specific grants that you can claim if you're entitled, if you're eligible for them. So if you meet the eligibility criteria, but you don't get your child support grant or you don't get your old age, old, older person's grant, you can take the, the government to court and, and get your money. But you can't claim beyond that. You can't claim to the full right to social protection, which the constitution does provide for. I'd like to just go back before we move forward to what Lynette was saying about the two pillars of social security, which is social assistance and social insurance. And of course, when we talk about South Africa's comprehensive social protection system in the global literature, we usually talk about the social grants, the seven social grants that provide support to categorically defined groups, children, older persons, persons with disability, and so on. And that covers quite a high proportion of the population, much higher than most other countries of a similar economic uh, level. So that's what gets a lot of praise in the international literature. But what's missing is that, that, that gap, 18 to 59 year olds, that Lynette highlighted, the, the people that are of working age but don't qualify for social grants because most governments, including ours, don't like to give free money to the working age population. They should work, otherwise I might make them lazy. 
Um, so there's no social grants for them. And on the other hand, they don't have access to social insurance because they're not formally employed. They don't have jobs with contracts which would enable them to make contributions to the unemployment insurance fund. And uh, Neil Coleman made, made a comment in the chat, only about 7% of the unemployed, that's seven out of 100 unemployed people are covered by the UIF. So it's miserable. You know, there's this huge uh, cohort of people, the working population, that have very little access to social protection, no rights, no entitlements to claim. Of course, we do have programs like the Expanded Public Works Program, the EPWP, which provides some kind of, you know, cheap labor for some people that get access to it, but it's very limited and it certainly doesn't fully meet those, those needs. So I guess what I was getting at with my question about what gaps has COVID-19 exposed in our social grant system is precisely that that working age population. And a lot of the response that came in was trying to fill that gaps, you know, with the TERS program, the Temporary Employee Relief Scheme, um, with the Social Relief of Distress Grant, which was only 350 Rand, but we still had millions of people applying for that. Um, yeah, so the idea was to try to provide some kind of income support to people that were sitting at home without any income, without any access to social protection. And if you're poor, very little savings to draw on. So um, yes, let's just go back to that and think about the government response. How adequate and how appropriate were these new interventions that the government introduced? Um, Alex has already highlighted some deficiencies in the way they were implemented, but was it a good response to try and provide some kind of income relief to people that had lost their incomes, that were sitting at home under lockdown, unable to work, um, or should they have done things differently? And also how well was those, were those programs implemented? Let me um, take a stab at that one. Um, and maybe I'll just, I'll just do an introduction first, but government introduced actually two grants simultaneously, the COVID-19 social relief of distress grant for six months for the unemployed and a caregiver's grant. Um, initially we thought that the caregiver's grant was a grant for, um, the child support grant, but it was actually for the adult. Um, or 500 rand for five months until they could get the system fixed on that one. And then there was a monthly top up of 250 rand for all of the grants except only that May month for child support grant. But the two, as you indicated, the two grants will come to an end. And our critique of, of the grant, both of these two grants, is that a, it should be a permanent measure. And secondly, that it's inadequate because it doesn't cover basic foods, energy sources, transport, cleaning, and other uh, just basic supplies that people need um, to eat and to, to, to get themselves ready. Um, and we have in our uh, petition asked for 1,227 Rand, which is the upper uh, bound poverty level. Um, now, government introduced uh, and said, I mean, the president and Tito Mboweni followed up and said it's 50 billion, but actually it shrunk to 42 billion. And I think it's currently sitting at 40 billion. Um, so nobody can explain where the, the 10 billion went. Um, there was um, challenges with the, with the delivery model and the challenges with the delivery model has been that most of it is online, um, an online platform. Um, and, and so the, the challenges with that was one of, of access. Um, so without technology devices, data and internet connectivity, um, many had to go through intermediaries and these intermediaries charge people um, poor people um, who should be having access to, to these grants. And uh, both the minister and um, the SASA CEO had promised that volunteers, uh, NDA volunteers would be rolled out across the country um, from June. And we still need to see where they are. So access to SASA offices for, for these um, uh, grantees has been a serious problem. The, the second one has been the issue of outdated verification databases. Uh, we presented SASA with a couple of cases of UIF. They realized, oops, that database is, is dated. We presented cases of NASFAS, of SARS, of um, 
those that were registered on, on databases for uh, EPWP and other public works programs were also dated. And it just confirms the point that Alex made earlier on. Then there was issues around the autom automated response messages. So such as you receive income in the last 18 months are unhelpful because people now have no money and they are newly unemployed or they were unemployed before that. There's a defective appeal system that was introduced only in August, and it violates the rights of, of, those, of, of those eligible to administrative justice. There's no proper recourse that, that um, recipients can actually access independently. Um, problems with the eligibility criteria, and they literally take the issue of you not having income and they monitor your bank account is that if you have not received any income for that month, you will not get the grant. Um, you will um, have to wait until next time. Every month there is, is an assessment. Um, and then there were huge problems around um, people who don't have bank accounts who need cash. Um, and so many of the cash payments were challenged, channeled through SAPO, resulting in long queues and cash shortages and only recently that they appointed other banks, but we haven't yet seen those um, um, being delivered. And then just the general issue around corruption and fraud, as noted in the Audit Auditor General's report on uh, food delivery, as well as government employees benefiting from the, from the COVID grant. So those are just some of the, both the lessons and the challenges um, of, of, of the system. Thank you. Very, you know, it's, it's quite important to note that virtually every single one of the issues Lynette has noted have been part of long-term systemic reforms proposed to the social security system. Our current institutional framework for social security is not fit for purpose. Therefore, it cannot easily um, uh, uh, address either short or long-term issues. So the disconnect between the UIF and SASA the um, uh, Department of Home Affairs, uh, the health system, the educational system, uh, the road accident fund, um, defunct road accident fund, and the sort of compensation fund is that incoherence has been raised since 2002. So the so there is a, an issue about the institutional architecture, but in in terms of the question on the social grants and the and social insurance is we also require a, an architectural configuration of that system that makes sense, that makes sure that there are not incoherent gaps that exist in large parts of the system, like between sort of 19 and, uh, uh, and 59. So I'll give one example. And these are parts of recommendations that have already been made. Firstly, the UIF is an insurance fund. It is not a, it cannot provide social assistance. It's not structured for it and its revenue model doesn't allow for it. It really only addresses people moving between employment and periods of cyclical unemployment. So its impact systemically on, um, on addressing the long-term problem we have of structural unemployment in South Africa is an impossible with the UIF. The, um, so the proposals that have been made is that the benefit structure needs to alter. So part of it can still remain on the balance sheet of the UIF, in that if you provide an extension benefit to the UIF, a flat rate benefit longer than the current benefit, you can provide longer support for people who have become more structurally employed, but who historically were employed. But that doesn't help all the people who are never employed and all the people who have become structurally long-term unemployed. So for that, you require what we have is a further development of what we have the, as a, a starting point, this COVID grant. Um, it's only a starting point. It is not a coherent social assistance grant for unemployment. If you develop that framework, um, anybody that basically falls out of the, further, the earlier two categories I mentioned should be eligible for a social assistance benefit. And the question is whether or not that is um, made conditional upon um, participation in uh, labor activation programs. But what is very clear is that don't bother to create labor activation programs and special employment programs if you don't provide income support while you run them. So the, uh, the issue is you can't design labor activation without income support. So really South Africa does miss 
uh, a large part of the gap, and this is aside from the discussion on basic income grant, which is a sort of universal, unconditional um, allocation, which is a kind of an ambient transfer to, to much of society to correct the imbalances in the distribution of income. But when you're actually dealing with the problem of unemployment and structural unemployment, you actually require a combination of income support and structural interventions that go into the labor market and also tie industry to the labor market. We do not have those, and we do not have the systems for those. Um, so social assistance for the unemployed is actually what we're beginning to talk about. The, um, the caregiver allocation which was provided has been a long-term recommendation to be introduced as an adjunct to the child support grant, but in, in fact, it was just used as a cheaper alternative in the, uh, in the current crisis. Whereas in fact, what should happen is that there should be a caregiver component to the child support grant. It is absolutely ridiculous that the grant is given in respect of the child only and not in respect of the caregiver. So those are, that's a huge gap that needs to be permanently filled. Um, so I, I think that there are quite a few um, uh, sort of uh, uh, expansions to the architecture of the social grant system, which require considerable discussion within the context of saying what should our complete right look like. So the question therefore is, um, you know, what if you, it is possible to have an entry level version of a complete right and to then make sure that you, you've got a systematic program of progressively moving toward the complete version of that right. So rather than just the ad hoc um, uh, uh, sort of poking at additional grants and amounts, so what we've had to this, at this point and in relation to COVID is, um, is a, a, a set of programs that were introduced under an emergency setting in which basically society has been given no real um, confirmation that this is part of a longer term consideration. It's purely an emergency intervention with the understanding that it will disappear the moment the emergency is gone. So I, I think that we do, we are missing the wider discussion as to what our, um, uh, framework should look like. And uh, you, you don't really build social security systems on social grants alone. You build them through an interaction with coherent social insurance structures. And we need both of those. When people fall off social insurance, as it states in the constitution, um, you must have access to adequate social assistance. And in some cases, people on social insurance will get social assistance as well in a well-designed system. So uh, I think that we, we, we do have to also think long-term about that architecture, but that configuration of grants that I've just talked about in relationship to social insurance requires that we're not working off, of, or off an, ex, you know, a, uh, um, a, a, an institutional framework developed in the 1960s. And uh, we cannot continue with this institutional framework and build new programs and new grants and, um, and have greater impact on society with what we've got. So we've, we've got to have more than the Apple IIe to move forward. Hey. Thank so, you, uh, um, Isabel. I think that that's a really good introduction for a point that I want to raise. I mean, we're talking a lot about the, um, the problems and challenges with the state's response. I think that we've crossed an incredibly important threshold, and that is in making income available to working age people. So, uh, Stephen, you referred to the fact that nobody likes giving money to uh, working age people. I think that we need to acknowledge that our social security system is premised on the apartheid system of giving income to, uh, to, to basically to white people premised on the idea of full employment. Now we know that full employment is never going to, it, it's not a reality, it's not something which is achievable. Um, and yet we have a deep conservatism amongst policymakers about giving cash, about giving income to working age people. So um, I, I think to my mind, that the, the ideological threshold of, of crossing that through the caregivers grant and through the social relief of distress is something which we really need to work on, embrace and work on. I think, to my mind, the other aspect around um, one of the, 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 the uh, interventions that have happened um, is that there's also an increasing recognition of the need for demand in poor communities. There's not enough, and that's something which um, I think economists of this world need to be addressing. But if you look globally, a lot of the uh, COVID recovery interventions started at the individual, then went to the community, 
and went to, then went to the businesses. Initially in South Africa, most of the thinking went that we need to support businesses because those are the ones that employ people um, and those are the ones that keep our economy together. But as time has progressed and um, the economy is facing greater and greater distress, are engaged in these decisions, there is a real recognition that unless there is demand in the hands of ordinary individuals, uh, interventions at a higher level are bound to fail. Um, so notwithstanding the fact that we need to look at augmenting the very mediocre and incredibly poor policy design that's happened, I think we need to embrace and, and build on the fact that for the first time ever, working age people uh, were given social assistance um, and that needs to be something that forms the basis of far greater interventions. Um, I, I know that these discussions are kind of uh, taking up a, a lot of the time and space, but I think that for me, one of the huge, just, uh, the, the, the horrific policy gaps that have happened has been around the social relief of distress eligibility. So what you don't want in any social security system is a disincentive on people to work. The fact that there's been an absolute means, uh, a zero means testing, so any, any income disqualified people from eligibility for social relief of distress was a massive mistake. So I think uh, the, the kinds of, of um, social assistance programs that we want to embrace going forward recognize that people need to be encouraged to work. And so the means test um, has been already identified by National Treasury um, as a sort of lead negotiated by government on those aspects as being something that needs to be eradicated in social grants. But so I, I think what's emerging um, and really looking towards what Alex was saying about the structural overhaul of social security system is um, it's clear that you need to have something which is not means tested in the way that these grants are um, and also that covers vulnerable working age people. Thank you, Isabel. I'm, I'm looking for positive lessons from the COVID-19 response, and I think you have identified one or possibly two. Um, the first is that, yes, we did cross a threshold. It was accepted that working age population in South Africa who are unemployed, whether temporarily because of COVID-19 or longer term, do deserve and are entitled to expect some kind of social assistance from the state. And that recognition is there now. And I think it also was underlined by the the announcement by the Minister of Social Development about five or six weeks ago now that the government was seriously considering a basic income grant, um, which has really not been on the table since before Trevor Manuel's time or even discussed. So yes, there does seem to be a recognition that we have a structural unemployment problem which cannot be solved through economic policies. Social policies have to pick up some of that and that might require some kind of long-term large-scale intervention similar to the social grants or expanding the social grant um, safety net. So that's now on the table. I actually did walk back from that, so it hasn't it's gone quiet since that uh, initial excitement, but uh, it's, it's out there. So that's one thing. Um, and I think the other thing that we have learned at a more operational level, which is also similar to experience from other countries, is that um, programs that work better uh, out of this package of support that was introduced were those that that built on existing programs. So it was very easy just to add 500 Rand as a, as a grant to, as a top up to the child support grant as the caregiver allowance. And that's quite easy to do because the people are already registered, the payment system is in place. You don't have to go through a screening and a targeting and a registration process. Uh, whereas the, the new programs that were set up, especially the special uh, social relief of distress grant, really struggled to get off the ground because of the dif difficulties around uh, processing. So, um, Building on existing systems is always easier. Topping up is always easier than setting up new programs in the middle of a crisis. That's what, another lesson that we've learned. But what, what I would like to do now in the, in the last part of this question part, uh, discussion part before we go to open to questions is to look forward and to, to give Lynette first a chance to, to, to introduce the very exciting idea that the Black Sash has come up with and is advocating for, which is the basic income support not the basic income grant, but the basic income support grant. Maybe you could say something about that, Lynette, um, and then we can throw it open for to the other two panelists and then to the to the participants more broadly. So what do we need to do immediately post October when these uh, relief packages and new grants come to an end? Um, and what's the longer term uh, scenario for social protection building back better post COVID-19? Um, 
what we have, I mean, we, we, we did our research and, and, and one of the issues that um, we identified was this huge gap for 18 to 59. And if we just thought if we can work with that as a beginning, um, then that would take us, us forward. Um, so we're we asking for some sort of um, income support, uh, basic income support. Um, if, if one were to frame it in, in, in permanent social assistance, that would also do, but some form of income support for that cohort, at least at the upper bound poverty level of 1,227 um, rand. And that should include the caregiver giver grant. Um, so that all the adults in that cohort um, are covered and beginning one can target those with no um, and little income as a, as a means test and later on expand that um, into, into something else. We're also asking that the, the state topped up um, all the grants except the child support grants, but we're asking that those top ups, including perhaps a, a top up for child support grant that those top-ups must be made permanent because the grants are very, very low. And um, the child support grant, for example, does not even meet the minimum food uh, poverty line. Um, so that, that is a, a, some kind of a yardstick and we later, as we formulate and build the system, we, we, we move that to a, to a completely different level. Um, we're also asking that um, the government must ensure that, that um, just like the refugees, the asylum seekers, and the and the migrant workers with per special permits fought through the Scalabrini case for them to be included in this um, the COVID grant, that those must be honoured and they must uh, be in the provisions um, going forward. And then all of that should work us towards a universal uh, basic income grant. But we need to. Uh, open, keep the gap open of 18 to 59. And um, we're asking people to sign our petition that's online with um, uh, amandla.mobi. Um, so please send you to, to your links and whatever we want to get at least a million um, signatures on that amandla.mobi. Um, or if you're struggling, just contact our uh, BIS, BIS at blacksash.org.za or look for our campaign um, on the Black Sash uh, website. Um, thank you, Stephen. Lynette, before I ask Isabel and Alex for their ideas mm -hmm. and their suggestions, um, I'm going to jump in straight away with this big question that people always ask about the basic income grant and your BIS is also uh, going to be questioned in the same way, which is this issue of cost and affordability. I know it's easy to say, oh, it's too expensive, it can't be afforded, and that's easy to, 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 to dismiss the idea using the, using the financial argument, but it is extremely expensive. So if you use the upper bound poverty line, according to your own calculations, uh, it would cost about 170 billion rand, that's B with a B not M, a billion rand, uh, um, every single month for 18 to 59 year olds. And we know that the Department of Social Development spends about 180, 200 billion rand a year on the social grants at the moment. So you're going to be spending the entire annual budget every single month on this uh, basic income support grant. And if you were to do a basic income uh, grant for the entire population, then it becomes, you know, 800 billion rand a month. It's just way off the charts. And I have to almost agree with Trevor Manuel when he said way back uh, that uh, the basic in income grant would bankrupt South Africa. Is there money for it? Is it affordable? Is it realistic? Um, I would say yes, because the, the question is, is that uh, we're framing it as a form of social assistance. There are people in need. There are people who do not have any income, who go um, to sleep hungry. And the state has at least an obligation in terms of food security to ensure that people um, get food. You can't buy a lot of food with 1,227 um, rand. Um, and so there, there are many, many different ways in which one can skin that cat. It's listed in our, in our book, Basic Income um, Support, um, A Case for South Africa. And if somebody just puts it on a chat or visit the Black Sash website, you will find um, the, the responses of how you can find the money. Um, in that. There's a long list of, of ways in which to do it. And I would encourage everybody to have a look at that book. It's really interesting and topical. Isabel, 
Thank you. I'm going to come in here because um, I expect that Alex will be able to address a lot of the questions that uh, will be coming around the financing. Um, I, I want to sort of conclude my contribution to the panel part of this discussion by really looking at the political economy around what we're talking about. So you mentioned Stephen um, Trevor Manuel, um, and he, he was very clear about his opposition to a basic income grant. But that was in 2003, 2002. In 2005, we had a budget surplus, and yet we were still told it was unaffordable. So when I was working in the Black Sash at that point in time, together with the Society and the Council of Churches, um, we commissioned some research looking at the objections and, and how to address those. But it became clear that each time we addressed an objection from uh, decision makers, another one was raised. So I think the extent to which people come uh, with sort of clean hands to these objections needs to be interrogated. I continue to be completely taken aback at the conservatism that rests with decision makers around the deserving and the undeserving poor. So I was witness to a discussion recently by people who really make the policy who someone said, well, we can give it to um, SMMEs because those people have made the effort um, to get themselves out of poverty. And that fails to take into account many of the structural um, uh, community uh, obstacles to people getting up and helping themselves, um, as well as the ideological points that, uh, that negates the universal aspect of, of rights. So, um, I mean, it's, it's clear that within government, there is a huge opposition, uh, there's, a, there's a huge divide between um, the Minister of Social Development, who you mentioned, who made the announcement, and those who, who hold the purse strings, National Treasury. And within the NEDLAC process around social security uh, review, I mean, basically, that stymied government from being able to put a position on the table for sort of close to, to eight years. So I think that that continues to happen. The, for me, the scary aspect of that debate is that while we might engage with Department of Social Development on policy formation, the real decisions have probably already been taken by National Treasury, and that happens in a completely inaccessible space. So. Um, I mean, the, the point around how the shifts happen, I agree that the shift shouldn't be taken on populist um, sort of big decisions, but I think there's been a huge amount of research that goes into this that shows where uh, financing can come from. Um, and for me, the question is, where does the political will, where, where does political leverage lie? The aspect of social delivery protests, which are uh, protests that are called social delivery protests, I think need to be recognized as, as people protesting against poverty. Um, and I think as campaigns such as the Black Sashes campaign um, are launched, the way that we can try and harness those people's voices into a space that is, is quite exclusionary is critical. Um, so yeah, I just want to conclude by saying that uh, I uh, was recording a podcast with Guy Standing the other day. He's done a lot of work globally on pilots and, um, and the whole idea of universal basic income. Um, and his, his concluding line there was, um, can South Africa afford not to have a basic income grant, uh, not to have a comprehensive social security? And if you look at what we've wasted in the last 26 years um, and sort of stack against that, the kinds of deficits that COVID have added to that, uh, to my mind, it's very clear that South Africa cannot not afford to have a basic income. Thanks. Before giving the floor back to Alex, um, Lynette, can I put one more question to you? One of the things that I find very appealing about the basic income support proposal is that it does target an identified gap. In other words, COVID-19 has exposed the 18 to 59 year old um, gap in the social protection or social security system. And the BIS is targeting that particular uh, vulnerable group. So is it um, fair to say that your idea is to use the BIS as an entry point towards a universal basic income grant? Or do you think that this is really what we need to fill to, to complete the, the social security system? If we have the BIS, then we have a complete set of social grants from birth to death, cradle to grave. And uh, the basic income grant then won't become um, as, as, as difficult to defend because it's more affordable. The BIS is more affordable than the BIG. So perhaps you get more political traction with a, with a targeted grant of the 18 to 59 year olds? Um, I, I think that that um, um, demand in a sense is backed up by the fact that we have high levels of inequality, we have um, poverty and we have 
um, extreme unemployment, if, if extreme poverty and, and also high levels of unemployment. So if one take those three things together and you look at the just at the social assistance system at the moment, let alone the economic system, you, you will find that there is a gap. And, and, and South Africa with its human rights constitution cannot afford um, not to have some provision for those groups um, that has fallen on, on very, very hard terms. And we've seen those with the long queues, um, the, food, the food parcel queues, um, just the first week of, of many, many people standing for hours trying to get some food parcels, um, the delivery system changed, et cetera, et cetera. But that was an indication of, of the crisis. It, it just brought it to the fore. So yes, we, we will, I mean, the, the, the social assistance entry point is to working towards a universal ba basic income um, towards the end. Um, so that it's, it's like a, a almost a systematic slow um, upgrade of, of the systems together with what Alex said uh, in terms of the broader system. But yes, it's, it's working towards that. But right now we need to work with the 18 to 59s um, who have no no um, support. Thank you. Okay, thanks. It's just gone two o'clock. So I'm going to let Alex um, address this particular issue and then we'll take some of the questions that are in the Zoom room. So if you have any questions or comments to add, just write it in the chat, in the, the Zoom chat room. Um, uh, and we'll carry on till about 2.30 and pick up as many of those questions as we can. Um, Alex. Yeah, so one of the, so first of all, the the uh, most sustained attack on social grant expansion is the fiscal side of it. And um, the fiscal position of government has worsened considerably since uh, uh, the beginning of the year. And part of the problem that will be raised by government is that it's not in a position to borrow to finance the deficit anymore. It's re reaching its borrowing limits. And uh, the scale of the economic negative, uh, ec economic decline has uh, meant that it, it essentially can't even stimulate the economy using uh, fiscal measures. That would be the kind of argument that comes forward. The arguments in, uh, in favor, the, uh, the macroeconomic arguments in favor of social grants, that what it's essentially doing is it's restructuring the distribution of income so that it's separating uh, the distribution of income from employment and from earnings from assets, earnings from profits. And, uh, and what you're doing is creating an income distribution which um, fills a gap which is not filled by those more limited forms of distributing income, and that, that's necessary. But it doesn't necessarily harm employment. And this is where all the evidence that has been built up is, is quite critical, is that it shows that if even the person who's the recipient isn't necessarily the person who creates the job, it's when they, when they hand that money over and buy something they stimulate a completely different structure of the economy through a restructuring of our consumption in, in, the, in society. Now, one can make that argument in selection, and it might even be something that many people believe, but they don't want to take the risk when you pose a huge program overnight. So there is enormous advantage in, uh, in adopting strategies that look very carefully at what is the next most important intervention and to get it in and to allow for an incremental expansion of the system and with the understanding that one is going to examine and test it even though one can't do um, the uh, uh, um, definitive tests of the stimulus effect the knock-on effects of social grants but it is quite clear that they I mean I think the evidence has built up so much that it is a positive sum game when you expand social grants. It's not taking from someone to give to somebody else. And the standard assumption when somebody says, here's the cost of a social grants program is that it's a zero sum game. Somebody has to lose for somebody else to win, as opposed to a, um, the dynamic effects of social grants, which actually restructure parts of society um, and uh, stimulate economic development and growth, but stimulate a more inclusive growth uh, trajectory. So I think these are important arguments, but the question is, how do you how do you reduce the risk for the people who don't really who are unsure about um, what they're doing? So the scalability of proposals is quite important. 
getting them in, but with the understanding that one wants to build them up continuously, but making sure that they are properly evaluated to see all the knock-on positive effects. Much of the positive effects of the child support grant have just been ignored by government, despite the fact the research has been created that shows why an expansion would be beneficial. So I think that these arguments do need to be brought to the fore. It is a lot really less risky to expand social grants than it uh, would appear. But if one goes for big bangs and populist proposals, it's very easy to shoot down just using the simplistic fiscal uh, position argument. I think that the um, affordability issue is always the one that's used to, to, to shoot it down, as you say. Um, but what is, what's encouraging is that there is a lot of work that's being done, including by Black Sash, but also by the Institute of Economic Justice. And Alex himself has done a lot of work on this in terms of costing these alternative um, possible interventions, in terms of finding, finding possible funding sources or fiscal space to, to pay for it. And also um, in terms of looking at the economic benefits, because there are these kind of Keynesian multiplier effects that come from social grants. If you inject money into communities, they spend that money by buying goods and services, and that creates jobs and, and employment and income for other people. So we, we do know that there are um, all kinds of benefits from, <laughs> from benefits. Um, but there are these real questions about, for example, the, the, the trade-off or the opportunity cost, as one person has put it in the chat. What would be the trade-off or the opportunity cost of a basic income support? If you're going to spend so much money on this uh, particular program, who is going to lose out? You, you have to take it from somewhere. Either it's deficit financing or it's reallocation of public spending, um, and that's going to need to be paid for. Um, there are also questions around... Um, Yes, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> excuse me, about who you target. Should we, should we look at um, a household level targeting rather than a, an individual based targeting? At the moment, we have this kind of this uh, individualized approach whereby children are targeted with the child support grant, although children are obviously in most cases in a household with, with caregivers, and it's the caregivers who are unemployed that actually need the income to feed their families. So do we need to think about a, a household level approach rather than a basic income for each individual um, person? So yes, questions around trade-offs and how we could reconfigure the system in order to make it more effective in terms of meeting needs. Anybody? Um, Stephen, I, I think the, the question that really um, my attention was that your concluding one about the household. I think if you look globally at social security studies, it's very clear that um, as soon as you start targeting households, you start approaching questions of decision making within households, and that comes to power uh, hierarchies and, and frequently patriarchies. So the point about uh, uh, income going directly to the household means that um, you come up with especially gendered dynamics around decision making. So um, I, I'm categorically opposed to the, the kind of concentration of income to a household level. I think the, um, although many people view the constitutional rights to individuals as being quite liberal um, rather than transformative in this aspect, I think that if you concentrate the income as being received by individuals, you're able to look at to a far greater level of freedom. Okay, um, let me just raise another question then from the, from the Zoom chat. The question is, has any international experience of responses to COVID-19 using social protection emerged during the last six months, good and bad? Um, and I think it would be quite helpful for us to reflect a little bit on what other countries have done and um, how effectively they've responded. Um, one thing that's quite striking, if you look at very rich countries like the UK with their furlough scheme, which provided quite a high proportion of income replacement to people that were sitting at home unemployed, uh, or the US with their um, payment protection package. There was a large response, a very expensive response in wealthy countries. But of course, the paradox of social protection of course, is always that the poorest countries have the least capacity to deliver um, the needs that, that are there. So the richer countries could afford to have very expensive programs. We, as an upper middle income country, had a fairly uh, generous response, but obviously ineffective. Um, does anybody else have any other reflections on other countries and what they've done? And has the, um, the experience of COVID-19 shown us any, any um, 
movement towards basic income grants as a measure going forward uh, that you're aware of? So just to, I, th I think just to comment uh, on, uh, I think the, the differences between what you'd find in, in countries equivalent to South Africa and, and Lara versus the industrialized countries is the industrialized countries with um, a more effective, more developed um, social security institutions were in a position to uh, target their benefits more effectively. So if you were looking at the equivalent of a furlough scheme, um, you could identify the individuals very quickly. In, our, in uh, other environments, you end up with very broad um, programs that don't, can't target a, a particular vulnerable person or group. Just to note that the TERS type scheme, the furlough type scheme, has been identified in South Africa for many years as something that should be looked at, particularly after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. South Africa sat on its hands. So it's never actually developed the capability to keep, if, if for any reason you're a, a major strategic industry or employers are closing down because of a temporary crisis, you wanna keep them going. You, you wanna keep people in employment, therefore you need to have a system in place that can allow for a quick negotiation and set it up and use your social security system to pay, supplement people's incomes. We actually don't have the system to do that very efficiently. But that would be the difference, is that a lot of developing countries that don't, haven't got very good social security administrations and systems end up with very um, crude responses and ones that leave out lots of vulnerable people and the uh, more ad advanced systems, uh, advanced countries, I don't like using that word, but uh, uh, more highly developed, more sophisticated social security systems could basically target many more people, leave fewer people out. Maybe can I just add to that? I, I think that there are certain dynamics um, of the South African society that we do need to take into account. We have got very high levels of inequality. Uh, many of the countries that, that, that introduce and high levels of unemployment up to 50 at the moment uh, many of the um, developed countries have got unemployment rates um, prior to COVID of under 10%. So the balance between um, social security on the one hand and work provision on the other um, is, is slightly different in, in the dynamic. Um, and we, we, we looked, we reviewed many, and we saw that some people had ones off um, like, like Namibia had once off a payment of a set amount. Um, there were others who um, um, used the existing um, social assistance infrastructure, whether it's individual or families, um, to roll out um, a little bit more comprehensively um, and then reduce that as, as the period goes over. There were others who introduced um, the UIF mechanisms um, so there was a combination, but nobody rolled out a complete, uh, full universal basic income um, support. So if one were to look at the parameters, there were many different ones that they have used. But I think in South Africa, we have to deal specifically with the high inequality and with the unemployment that is so high. Um, because in other countries, the unemployment rate prior to COVID was under 10% particularly in the developed countries. So Stephen, just briefly um, coming in, in there, the two countries' responses that interest me, the first is Namibia, our neighbor. Um, they've had a long history. In fact, today, the uh, Namibian Coalition on Basic Income Grants has just been relaunched. Um, the state there came up with a once-off payment um, of a universe, uh, no, it was, it was meant to be universal, but it became sort of means-tested towards the end. Um, so a humanitarian response of a once-off payment. Um, that led the way, however, for the, the aspects that um, Alex has been talking about, about the registration of people using mobile phones. So that was interesting, but it was very clearly just to address the immediate uh, shock effect of COVID. It was also at a time quite early on, I think it was March. So the extent and um, longevity of the impact of COVID is something which uh, policymakers were not aware of. Um, the country that interests me is Spain. Um, so 
um, quite early on, I think around April or May, Spain introduced uh, a universe, no, a targeted scheme, so similar to social relief of distress from our side. But the interesting thing is that it, it's a long-standing, it's a permanent relief scheme. So although it came in the wake of COVID, it was specifically adopted to, um, to continue well or into perpetuity. Um, some of the aspects around the adoption, I tried to reach out to, to researchers to discover, but unfortunately a lot of people went away for their summer holiday. But I think we can see that those are, are sort of setting parameters around um, schemes that we can look forward to in terms of having a feedback loop into the kinds of um, multiplier impacts here in South Africa. One of the countries I hope we don't learn from is the UK. <laughs> I heard um, Boris Johnson a couple of days ago arguing that the, um, the furlough scheme has to end at the end of September because we can't keep paying people to sit at home not working. So that kind of attitude that, uh, you know, people are being encouraged to sit at home, they're being disincentivized from working, is always used as an attack on social protection everywhere. But it's also now being used as a way of, of justifying the ending of these temporary programs and forcing people to go back to work, whether or not the environment is safe. So um, as we move towards the end of this discussion, uh, what do you think is the immediate priority post-October, uh, post the six-month period of, of the of the the, the stimulus package, and what sh what do you think is achievable? You know, given the political context, the austerity, the fiscal space is probably, if anything, going to be closing in the coming months, as the reality of unemployment and business closures and so on and reduced tax collection hits uh, starts to hit. What's what's feasible? What can we expect the government to do? What should we ask the government to do? What sh what should we demand in the short term? Given that a basic income grant is probably a bit further down the line. What's the immediate priority? What's most urgent? What can we hope to get the government to do to support those people that are still affected by COVID-19 and will be in the coming months? Income support for those between 18 to 59 with no or little income. And whether we start at the lower end or whatever, but that's what we are saying to government. We must continue um, the combination of COVID and um, um, caregivers grant um, so that we at least keep the foothold um, for that group that's been excluded, not um, to their own doing, um, but structural unemployment um, and uh, compounded by COVID, that those, that group must continue to benefit. Thank you. And presumably at a higher level than the 350 Rand, right? Because that's yes, really absolutely, not, absolutely. Yeah. Permanent and, and, and at a higher level, of course. I think that the argument has to be made that th this is a positive sum game, that in fact we are going to get economic growth benefits from exact continuing with that. I agree with that, that we should maintain the programs we've introduced and understand their impacts and look at enhancements and, and uh, measure them and demonstrate um, the, the benefits of those programs. South Africa is going to, I would expect, it is going to bounce back. It's had this huge hit because it shut down both the supply and the demand side of the economy simultaneously. That just in and of itself, from a timing perspective, creates uh, a fiscal crisis. It doesn't necessarily create a long-term economic crisis. It creates a fiscal crisis in that during this period of time, government didn't raise the taxes to fund its deficit. And therefore, it's got to go to capital markets and try and raise that money. And so it's going to be resistant to anything that expands that deficit, no matter what. So the argument has to be created that, in fact, these programs are, are, um, have a positive effect on economic growth, which will have a return in terms of higher tax revenue down the line. And that argument is really the one that one has to win in, in, in this particular period. But I think that it is important to maintain these programs after they've been implemented. Um, but they have to be evaluated because there's a the danger that they just introduced and nobody see it. There's an economic growth effect that is going to happen. There's going to be a rebound. They're going to attribute that to other factors. But there is something that is very clear when you go around, the economy is rebounding wherever it's reopened. And uh, so it's, it's not as if we're in a completely disastrous position from an economic perspective, but um, uh, what we mustn't do is is allow the um, 
uh, uh, these programs to pull back. But I, I do think we do need, we really do need the evidence on the macroeconomic side, as well as on the, um, uh, the employment and, ec and economic and sort of the industrial impact of these programs to be shown to be beneficial. Um, I think that will be very important in building the case for increasing them and seen as a coherent strategy for um, continuously improving conditions in South Africa. And just a final point I did raise in the issue that there are two sort of positions that uh, exist. Uh, uh, one is that unemployment is the problem in South Africa that is causing inequality. And therefore our strategies have to directly focus on it, on addressing unemployment through growth pro proposals and special employment programs, et cetera, et cetera. And the other position is that in fact, our inequality and our unemployment is caused by our inequality. And therefore our direct interventions have to focus on inequality, income inequality first as a means to get um, employment restructured. So these are two diametrically opposed positions and the NDP favors the one that says employment is the problem. And I think that until we've addressed that intellectually as well, we're going to remain with this problem that social assistance is a cost. Um, so I think the Alex, the two positions that you just described to my understanding also reflect um, the RDP versus gear to a large degree um, and, and the con problems that came into um, our macroeconomic policing well, setting with regards to gear. Um, Stephen, I think that my concluding comments are just to caution against us thinking that we, needed to, we need to get back to pre-COVID moments. I mean, we know that unemployment had skyrocketed, uh, expanded unemployment 39.7, and that was before COVID. Um, our e economy was in a recession. Um, when I hear uh, policymakers trying to edge back to that as a standard, I get very alarmed. I think that uh, for policymakers, we need to be looking at trying to expand beyond where we were. Um, I think the thinking and research of people like Alex, like the IEJ, um, really needs to be embraced um, over and above the kinds of orthodox policymaking um, that has led us um, at a national level. So the point about trying to see new ways forward, um, looking at the failings, I mean, as Alex was saying, it's not just the um, understanding of what's happened in the last couple of months, but also what went wrong prior to that, that kept on um, coming up with null returns, and yet it, they kept on coming back as, as being policy dictates. So my concern is that the window is closing. I think the, the kind of rebounds that Alex was referring to will be taken by many as affirming that we can now just go back without looking at, at, look at, at sort of systemic shocks which are required. Um, and I think that the Black Sash and other coalitions that come in here um, need to try and harness as much popular support um, in terms of millions of people affected by poverty to ensure that this becomes something which, which can be remarkably positive in going forward. Thank you very much for this debate. Thank you all. It's impossible to summarize the richness of this discussion and the very uh, diverse inputs that we've got. But I do think we have a consensus around a few key points. Um, and maybe we can just try to extract those and see if we can take them forward in our respective uh, forums. I think the first that's come out is that we really need to look again at what is the social security right or the social contract around social security in South Africa. Um, we have a massive inequality problem in this country. We have a legacy of apartheid, uh, which has created structural um, inequalities and also that's replicated through the social protection system that we have in place now. What, what can we do about that? And, and what should be this, how can we reopen the debate around the right to social security, uh, broader than just the right to a grant? The second is, um, and I think this came very strongly in Alex's input, um, the need for a systemic overhaul of the social security system. We need to look at the whole system from registration, targeting eligibility, through to payment mechanisms, but the entire system, and, and that's been seriously exposed during the COVID-19 response um, in, the, in the delays, in the in mismanagement, in the corruption around food parcels and the TERS and the UIF. All these uh, schemes have been found wanting in terms of their delivery capability. So an overall, the actual system and how it's designed and implemented is needed. 
I think in terms of the immediate intervention, we probably all agree that the 18 to 59 year old gap in the social safety net has been highlighted by the lockdown, which forced those people to sit at home. And if you don't have access to UIF or social grant, you are living on nothing. How do you survive? So that's become a, a, a rallying cry. And I, I really welcome the input from Black Sash in terms of their, their report and their, and their uh, petition on trying to fill that gap, um, not just immediately, but in the longer term as well. We've, we now have some kind of impetus around the COVID-19 response and the fact that it's now recognized and accepted that this group needs attention, they need support, and the state has an obligation to provide that. So that's an immediate uh, intervention, but we need to not just make the moral case for that. We need to make the fiscal case that's affordable, and we need to make the economic case that it has benefits to the wider society and the wider economy. And that's, there's, there's work on that, and we can do more work on that, and we contribute to building that case in our various um, forums. So to conclude, we have a national state of disaster, but it's not just about COVID-19. It's around uh, poverty, inequality, unemployment, and social protection is one small response to all of that, but it's a vital response. And I think what we've learned from COVID-19 is the imperative to get it right and to do it better next time. And in fact, not just next time, but permanently. So um, I would leave this discussion with that thought that we have discussed the problems that we face in this country, but we have a lot of opportunities as well, a lot of resources, a lot of experience and history with us. Let's try and build, let's contribute to building back social protection and building it back better post COVID. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a good day. And join again next week. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs>